The following interview was conducted with Sarah Kelly, Professor Emeritus of Library Science and Life Sciences Librarian for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, July 17, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Sarah. And thank well, you. Thank you. Okay. Let's tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and okay. siblings in early years. Well, I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, January 6, 1943. My father was a physician, eye, ear, nose, and throat. My mother was a homemaker, but she had worked as when she was a single person, uh, first as a, a music uh, teacher for grades K through 12. She did that for one year and then decided that wasn't for her, and then she became a secretary. And they courted, I guess, for about, probably for about five years um, before they got married. Uh, I have a brother who's five years older than I am, and he uh, is very smart, and he's was in engineering, systems engineering. Um, I attended Wellesley College. Let's talk a little bit about your early years, grade school and high school, and then move on. Oh, to grade yeah. school? Yeah. Grade school and high school from uh, kindergarten through uh, my senior year in high school, I attended a private school, Lee Louisville Collegiate School, and it was... Uh, girls only when I was there and um, I received activities and athletics or things of that sort? Uh, an athletic person I was not uh, definitely not uh, we really it was a very intense kind of uh, scholastic environment so I did not have much time for outside activities they had some clubs of some sort did you join and not, in? not really many? okay um, How large was the school? Oh, my like goodness. They were probably about, I'm going to say about 240, 250 so students, all the way from kindergarten up. Oh, so it's K through, uh, okay. Right. K, K so through 12. Through the same one so my graduating class, there were only 13 of us in the class. And I did graduate the head of my class there. Um, but I was... I was very intent on doing well in my studies. I was probably an overachiever in some respects, in that respect. Um, so can we move on to... How did you happen to select, how did you select Wellesley? And tell us about campus and college life there. Um, I decided that um, I wanted to go to a very good school, and I also wanted to go to a school that was not uh, in my part of the country. So although I had looked at schools up in the east, Wellesley was one I did not visit. Fortunately, <laughs> I made a good choice there, though. Um, and it is a, it's about 13 miles away from Harvard and MIT. So you got the advantage of being in the Boston area. And uh, I think I received a very good education there. I majored in biology. I'd already decided before I went to college I was going to major in biology. Uh, and uh, I really, I enjoyed that very much. But I also enjoyed my other classes. I enjoyed, uh, I had a wonderful class in anthropology. For me that was a very, I, it was very much an eye-opening uh, experience. Um, and that's why I think you should go to college. You should not only go to college to get skills to do well professionally, but you should have your eyes open to other parts of the world. And certainly anthropology did that for me. Um, I also took a very good course. Um, I took a course in Shakespeare. I took many courses, but I took a course in Shakespeare, and I took a couple of courses in philosophy, one of them on aesthetics, which I thought was very good. Um, all in all, I thought, uh, I think I made a mistake there because I didn't uh, participate in extracurricular activities. So again, I was just a student. You know. okay. um, did you do any, what did you do on your summer vacation? Take any trips at all or, or did you go back home during the summers? Oh, one time I went uh, to the University of Michigan at a summer school in Felston, Michigan, and I took a couple of courses there. One just sort of a basic biology course. That was interesting. We lived in cabins around a lake, and uh, oh, had all nice sorts of places too. you could wander around. And it was it was like very summer nice. camp. 
Sort of, but a little bit more sure. challenging right. than that. Right. Um, so that that's about all I did, I guess. And after graduation, there. tell us what came. After graduation, uh, I didn't know exactly. I didn't have a job. Uh, I had this master's in biology. Well, you went on for your master's then? No, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I had uh, well, I did later on. Yeah, I knew. It so, uh, my brother had a cocktail party for some of his friends. Uh, at our house and I met one of those friends and I was chatting with her and she, and I was saying you know I don't know what what to do right now and I told her my background and everything she said well why don't you come down and, and, and maybe you can help out in the lab where I am and she was working for a professor Dr. Leonard Reisman who was a pediatrician with the University of Louisville and he was associated with the Child Evaluation Center, and actually was part of a team that assessed people who had um, developmental problems, basically. They could be perhaps people who had Down syndrome or maybe some other syndromes that they really hadn't identified, so they did a complete workup on all these people, including looking at their chromosomes. And so I ended up volunteering for him, uh, and then he put me on the payroll. In, the sec in a secretary's clerical line. I kept on getting these notes about secretarial stuff, but I was doing lab stuff for him. I was pricking baby's toes and putting, putting uh, the blood in a solution to grow the white cells and then fixing the white cells and, and uh, basically fixing the chromosomes on slides and then counting the chromosomes in maybe 50 or 100 cells. Um, I thought if I should go to hell right now, I'd probably be spending my time doing that. But anyway, it was uh, a starter anyway. Then we take we take photos of, of likely looking uh, cells, uh, chromosome configurations, and then we would actually line them up the way they were supposed to be lined up. And sometimes by doing that, you could notice that maybe they were missing part of a chromosome, or maybe one chromosome was really large, larger than it should have been. And uh, that is so crude now compared to what they do. Sure. Um, but I did that for a few years. But soon after I had started, uh, was put on the payroll for that, I got sort of restless and decided I'd see whether or not I could get a degree, in, a master's degree in biology at the University of Louisville. And so I started, he was a very liberal boss. And he said, sure, you go ahead and take a course if you want. So I did, I took a couple of courses. And in 1970, I received my master's degree well, you continue in, to work? in biology. Mm -hmm. um, for a couple of years, I didn't work. I was able, oh, you because I was doing school. an experiment. Um, and so I was really interested in what people would call now psychobiology. Um, I tried to mimic the effects of um, stress on pregnant mice by injecting them with a chemical. Uh, during the second trimester of pregnancy and then observing the behavior of the offspring and what they called an open field apparatus which is basically a, a box that was open on the top but had a grid on it and then you would look at the mice and their behavior during a certain period of time and note that down. So I found some there was some effect by doing that. So anyway took me a while to get the degree, but I got it. Um, and then I looked around and my friends who were in biology, even with PhDs, weren't, weren't getting hired at that time. So I went back to counting chromosomes. <laughs> um, and then I had a very good friend since childhood who decided she was going to be a librarian and she worked in the school library. She also worked at the University of Louisville and its library and she really liked being a librarian and then I heard from an acquaintance at work who was interested in being a librarian I thought I think I'll look into this because I enjoy to hunt for information and um, I decided it would be nice to be a medical librarian so I had my I could either have gone to Case Western Reserve or uh, Emory University and uh, 
I like the idea of going south rather than north, so I chose Emory. And I chose that because you could take a course which would um, lead to your certification as a medical librarian. So I went to Emory for a full year and got my library degree there. How did you like living down there near Georgia? Near Atlanta? Well, I was on campus and I shared, a, a, we sort of had a little You're suite. You're near Atlanta though, you know, you could get these Yes, right. I didn't really get in do too life. much of that. Sure. Um, a lot of people think library school is sort of a joke, but I, I didn't take it that way. Every, every course I had, if I had a special project, I tried to orient it toward medical librarianship. Uh, and um, I really enjoyed it. I had a wonderful advanced reference course. Uh, I still remember the lady who taught it. Um, I think she had actually gotten a library degree at Emory, too. Uh, and she really made us work very hard, but it, it was an excellent class. Mm -hmm. um, Is that library school still? Oh, no, oh. it went out of existence. I still get stuff from Emory. <laughs> so do mine doesn't exist anymore either. <sighs> so um, I think it got to the point that with the change in technology and everything, they're going to have to make a probably a pretty massive investment there. So, but that happened years after I left so so then um, I had to find a job what was the market like when you finished was it for a medical library you wanted to it was pretty good actually uh -huh. I think I did interview for a job at um, trying to think can't remember the name of the place it was in uh, it was in Alabama though mm -hmm. and <laughs> the person who interviewed me thought that the Dewey Decimal System should be revised and that we should all do sort of cataloging, you know, and I thought, I don't think so. <laughs> so. Mr. Dewey will roll over his grave. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, so anyway, then I, I did get a job at the University of South Alabama in Mobile, and I was their hospital librarian. Actually, um, although I had this um, elaborate title, biomedical information specialist, which I have to laugh when I saw that kind of title applied to somebody else here. But anyway, um, they had so I was basically in a one-room library, and I was working with the clinicians. Then you were the library, right? Mm -hmm. The other person, um, and so that was good experience, though. And then. Uh, they transferred me to an adjoining building to the nursing school library, which was very upsetting for the person who'd been the library, who had served as librarian there, did not have a library degree, but pretty knowledgeable lady. And it was at that time that I went to um, the National Library of Medicine for three weeks for their class in searching Medline, which they discontinued after a while, but. And that was interesting. Fortunately, my brother and sister-in-law lived in Reston, Virginia, and I boarded, boarded with them, and I would leave when it was dark, and my sister-in-law had shown me a shortcut to Bethesda, and so I would go there, and then I'd have breakfast in their little, seemed to me, an underground cafeteria, and then I'd have a full day of class, and then I'd come back. You know. um, so that, that was a good experience. Thought. I mean, we really learned about Very medical subject headings and all that stuff, and how the computer you know, does all this stuff. Uh, so then, <clears throat> um, did the university send the hospital sent you there for three weeks? Well, the univer the library did. Oh, okay. Um, because they were thinking of starting. The well, it's because they were going to be doing searching. Okay. okay. So they're going to offer medical search. So right. So um, then, I guess I stayed there a little over three years, and then I, um, one of my uh, people who had worked there um, went on to the University of, sorry, I gotta refer to my notes here. Um, yeah, it's in 76. Well, while I was there, the 
the head of the library, of the biomedical library, went on sabbat, had a little project with, with uh, Project Hope, which is a ship. Um, and so I was the acting director there for about three months. And then I went from there to the School of Medicine, University of South Carolina, where I was coordinator of public services. I was not particularly happy there. So I came home for a while, back to Louisville, and did a bunch of volunteer work. Also uh, worked on compiling a history of a banking complex in Louisville, which was pretty interesting. I looked at some really old documents. Found out that one old document they had, it disappeared, which was the, their minutes for the first several years of their existence. Um, anyway, that was that was interesting, and then I decided I really wanted to go back into to be a librarian. And uh, but I thought, you know, database searching has moved on. So I went to the University of Kentucky. I commuted there to take a class in basically in bibliographic searching, which was which was very good and brought me up to date. And then I applied for a job. Here, you were on the search committee, as a matter of fact. You and Stuart Saunders, and the person, of course, who was then head of um, public, Ruth public Hall. Ruth Hall. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, of course, Martha Bailey. So, um, and so I got the job. Okay. Now we move on to the Life Science Library at Purdue. Tell us a little about that, and then you ultimately became the head librarian. Right. Um, at How long Martha went after she retired, um, then you got the headship? Well, yeah, I was acting head, and then, right. uh, and then they had a national search, and then I right. applied for the, I mean, yeah. I got the job. And Ruth all left. Ruth all left soon after I got there. Um, well, I won't go into all that. She left. Maybe. She left. <laughs> um, so, okay, and when I came there, maybe I should to tell people, I came there in... Was that 83? 83. August 15th, 1983 was my first uh, day on the job. And I thought, what have I gotten myself into? It's hotter here than it is in Louisville. <laughs> it was horrible weather. Building is not air-conditioned, researchers. <laughs> um, but I should tell you about the way things were um, there. We had a card catalog, of course. Uh, AACR2, which was a uh, um, revised set of cataloging rules, actually, uh, was impacting the way you work with serials. So Martha was very much involved in getting every, all of our cereals, which we had many, many cereals. Um, this is a large, it was a large library for the life sciences. Right, and it served primarily the, primarily the uh, School of Agriculture and the Department of Biological Sciences. And really, I was brought in Good to, be, to be the liaison with uh, to the Department of Biological Sciences because they were the ones who were most likely to be upset, let's put it that way. Right. So in my interview, I interviewed with Sandy Ostroy, who was, um, who was the head of neuroscience. The no, he wasn't the head, oh, but he it? was the, the his, on, on their side, the liaison to the libraries, and uh, he watched the money like a hawk, you know. And uh, so I think I did fine in that job. I mean, I think they realized they were going to get attention and good service and so on and we had an approval plan service where we got books and then I would send them out for people to look at and then I'd have to retrieve them and and then we also had slips you know so lots of paper yeah and paper too record of of your financial situation it's not like it is now where you can go on and you can go into a, uh, you, you know you can go into a, a file and look at what's going on all the time, you you just periodically get, and then you pour over that and see. So sometimes you wondered, you know, were things right or not? 
but you just have to trust they were. We had a card catalog at that time. Uh, the person who was brought in about the same time I was was Susan Miller. She had experience in an egg library. And she said, we need to refile the, the card catalog. Well, we did that. We got it refiled. Uh, one of my jobs was to drop the catalog cards below the rod after a clerical person had filed them. Another one of my jobs was filling out, and Susan's too, was filling out a um, form if you wanted to transfer or withdraw serials. So I, I think back, and I think we did a lot of clerical stuff. And of course we did, we sat at the reference desk too. We also did some searching, and I remember we used an old deck writer. And you know if you make a mistake on the old deck writer, then you have to back up and mm -mm. And I would be a nervous wreck sitting down at the deck writer, and of course that would make me make more mistakes. And all the while I was thinking, we're spending money doing this because we used a commercial provider of databases, which was Dialog. One of my first um, sorties out of the town was to go to Chicago for an all-day course on some data dialogue databases. I'd never driven to Chicago before. It was nighttime when I left, it seemed to me. So I drove up there, and I looked at the map, of course, and everything, and fortunately, the Eisenhower Expressway ended right at the hotel where I was to have the dialogue courses. So I parked my car there, got upstairs, probably had a very few minutes, and then the class started. So that was my exciting time there. Um, anyway, okay, what else did we do? Well, we also, Martha spent a lot of her time just digging through stuff and straightening it up. Just so we knew what we had and it was identified correctly. We were still working with Serial's microfiche which was a joy to, to deal with because, especially with government documents. Because uh, they had the serials printout? They had the serials printout, didn't they? Well, we had a printout of what we had in our library. Sure. Not the master one. But, but not the master one. We also had a biochemistry library, which was staffed by a clerical memory, uh, member, uh, Pat Carmody. What Cal about hort did, uh, horticulture? Did they have their... Well, there were... Couple. There were several, li actually, there was also a little forestry library. Um, there had been, a practically every part of the egg school had had its own library at one time. And then when Joe Dagnese came as um, head of the Purdue Libraries, one of the, I'm sure, most challenging things he faced was collapsing the 28 or so libraries that we had into far fewer libraries. Well, the collapsing was still going on. I mean, while I was there, um, before I became head, I know we took care of the forestry library. Uh, we were hoping we'd get the biochemistry library taken care of, but that didn't happen until after I was head of the library and, and Emily Mobley was head of the library, Purdue libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we went through serials cancellations in 92 and 97. We went through, we saw no reason why we should duplicate what the, what the Management econo Economics Library had, so we dealt with meshing, sending the ag econ stuff, totally ridding ourselves of that and, and, and merging it with what they had in, in the Management Economics Library. Um, you, also did data, uh, you also did database searching too as well. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, and that That's how I happened to mention the deck writer, we sure, were doing right. that. And then you had to do the billing. Well, you know that because of the billing forms. And then, I don't know. Let's talk a little about instruction. What sort of instruction did you, were you involved in? Was there much going on when you came, or particularly in the biological sciences? I don't, I don't think that there, there was. And I'm trying to think. Let me refresh my memory again. Um, Because you're, you're on several committees. You know, we used to have that the one Judy Pask had the information. Right. We did, uh, and we got. We the had a pliers. big a big class for the basic biology course, which was biology 122, and I, I redid the exercises for that, uh, along with one of the persons who was involved, you know, on the biology side. Right. Um, 
I uh, I did well I have down here I did some work with an environmental science uh, seminar that was for agriculture class um, Biology 122, though, was the big one. I did some things on the graduate level, like for virology. Um, you had quite a bit. Did that some for forestry? I did quite a bit, actually. That's right. Yeah. Um, and also, you included in that the availability of the database searching as well, so that they right. could it for the faculty and staff who right. worked with them. Right. I did do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, then we came into the uh, CD-ROMs came around, right? About eighty-six, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually took some money. I actually contributed some money myself toward buying a CD-ROM player, so that we could, and then combined that with some money from a endowment. And we don't know what it was for. It was for the Kuiper Alcove. Keeper Alco, K E I P E R. Don't know who that person was, no notes about it, but there was money there, and I got permission to just uh, identify a little piece of the library as the Kuiper Alco, and that's where we did our CD ROM search. And we allowed, you know, we got people um, introduced to that. And that it, sort of was the start of doing your own thing, right? You know, electronically. It was, and then um, in 86, the National Agricultural Library had put out something called the Pork Industry Handbook on LaserDisc, and so I actually did some research about that, about how people interacted with the computer and f formulating searches on that, and so I got some articles out of that. Um, also spoke at one of the SLA and uh, the national meetings on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, people could do their do their own searching, so that was that was something. At the same time, people like really like looking at current contents, and when that became available on a diskette. Um, People were searching that. Some of them had their own, the faculty had their own personal subscriptions um, to that, and they, they, they just loved doing that. It's, it was interesting to me that age really didn't matter. There were people up in their 60s who were so thrilled and excited about technology and what it could do for them, and there were people my age who were sort of skittish about it. I just had to laugh. Um, Anyway. And you were, and the librarian served as a liaison. You, you were the backup, and you could give them some assistance, mm -hmm. uh, and that so that enhanced their comfort level. I think. Yeah, I think so. But right. I think some of them. I mean, Erwin Tessman in biology, for instance, I think had a subscription himself, maybe to Dialogue, and was doing some searching. Okay. Sure. So some people were just they did their own oriented thing. that way. That's right, exactly. And quite prepared, you know, to use it. Right, exactly. Um, okay, well, I actually, in looking at the classes that I did, I did some for food science for the graduate level seminars, um, uh, agronomy, um, just a, a lot of different things. Right, all the departments within the college. Right. right. And you also helped, uh, what would be, for the research, what would be the liaison with, say, life science and the vet? Uh, was there any liaison at all, or just no? But of course, they'd use the, the librarians cooperated with each other, and right. and um, we would have people come from the vet school to do searching. I mean, I even had somebody. One of the articles I wrote was um, information resources for people in uh, audiology and speech science, sure. right. because I had somebody come from there to for whom I did a search, and I thought. Hmm. <laughs> there is material here that can help. Yeah, right. And um, so I don't know why they have, I guess they thought, well, life sciences were interested in biology, and so they they came to me to have their searches done. Um, yeah. So. Let's start uh, switching a little bit. Uh, bioinformatics. Oh, that, that was came, you know, they had that work. Okay, well, that started. Uh, yeah. Katie Clark was. 
I saw it from Martha Bailey was a, there were three of us in the library at that time and she Katie Clark left for a position at um, the University of Illinois where she still is uh, and she was to be uh, I've forgotten the title but basically it involved the bi bioinformatics and I got to thinking about it and writing a job description so I sent Cheryl Kern Simarenko two job descriptions. One was the traditional, what we'd been doing, and the other one was, my idea was that this person should probably report, um, not to me, but maybe to somebody else who was the head of the science libraries. Uh, and so, Cheryl called me up, Cheryl Kern Simarenko called me up and said, why did you send me to? And I said, well, Cheryl, I'm not going to be here forever. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I was trying to look ahead. And so we, sh she modified that position description for the, bi for the bioinformatics person. Um, it made it a better, actually made it a, a better job description. And so that's, we went out for that because we knew that was going to be the cutting edge. Now, at some conferences, I'd heard a little bit about bioinformatics, but I thought, I don't know if librarians should be doing this or not. But I sort of changed my mind on that. But I thought we needed somebody who was highly qualified to do to it, who had an excellent. And so we got Diane Ryan, who had the background. She had a PhD. She worked as the head of a, lab a laboratory doing work, and she was extremely bright and very much interested in doing it and so when she came I said well your job is to get out there and talk to people and find out what they need and then um, Purdue had already brought in the School of Agriculture they'd already brought some folks from the National Center for Biote Biotechnology Information at NLM the National Library of Medicine they'd already brought some of those folks on campus to give a class so um, Diane was very smart and she used that as a jumping off point to see what they really were interested, what our potential attendees would be interested in having uh, in um, courses. And so from their responses to this survey, uh, we were able to craft um, a series of workshops which were given um, May. yes it was given in May and I'm trying to think of the year <laughs> it was a couple of years ago maybe Ray, four, four, four or four or five four. years ago right and um, and that was a big success so right. exactly. and different today than when that was very labor-intensive by the way to uh, get that thing together um, because you're coordinating a lot of people. Not well, only we were, and and uh, we had sort of a novice in conferences and to work with, and uh, it was it was interesting. I think it worked out very well, and I think the people from NCBI were were pleased with the response that they got, and uh, I think they would have liked to had to have had a you know another one, but. I understand, right. Uh, let's talk about some of the library committees that you're on, like PSAC, for example. Any, just a couple comments that you'd like to make on those? Oh, PSAC, well, PSAC. Or any uh, other, you were also involved in the weeding down in the... Oh, yeah, company. well, all of us were involved in sure. weeding in the... Uh, but you kind of coordinated that, helped out a lot. Well, I was one of them. Priscilla sure. Gahigan was another yeah. one. Um, who else? There were some other folks who worked on it. Um, yeah, I always, I, it seems to me that I've spent a lot of time weeding collections, first in the Life Sciences Library and then in storage. And so, uh, yeah, PSAC, I think, worked pretty well. Uh, that was basically, we were it. talking about operations in the libraries and trying to get some sort of consistency among the libraries. And I think. A lot was achieved under Emily's leadership to do that. Uh, we tried to think about 
the libraries holistically rather than my little kingdom. Uh, and I was all for that. I thought we really did need to do that. You waste, it's not fair to the user to have separate uh, circulation policies um, at different libraries. I drove people nuts. Um, so we needed some, we needed to be part of one library system, not just several little disparate parts. Right. And I think PSAC helped accomplish that. Exactly. And you uh, you reported to, I was thinking of unit heads with Cheryl and then you know, Emily too as well before she became uh, the dean. Or, uh, uh, well, the actually I reported to Barbara Pinzella. Right, before. And then I reported to Cheryl. Right. The one thing I liked about the libraries was that even from the very beginning I felt if I need to ask anybody anything, I could go ahead and do it. It didn't matter, you know, I could call up Bill Corrier and technical services and chat with him or I could talk to somebody else. Uh, if I had an idea that there was something we should do in the Life Sciences Library where when Martha was head, I'd say, now Martha, do you want me to do this or do you want to do it? She said, oh, you go on and do it. So there was a lot of give and take. Uh, yes, nice. and I think we were a pretty collegial group too. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were probably some tensions between people, but I never felt it was not really obvious to me. I felt there was a lot of collegiality. Right. And I liked that. That's right. And it makes it systems work a lot better. Yeah, I mean, you can work with people you don't like, but it's nice if you can if communicate with people. Right. What about university committees? Did you serve on any of those for the university at all? Any of them, Annie, do you recall? You weren't on the Senate, were you? I was on the Senate. Oh, okay. Um, in fact, I had to present something to the Senate one time. I'm trying to think what that was. I think it had to do with representation on the, of the libraries. Oh, the seats for the library? Yeah, allocation. Oh. I can't even remember. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. That's um, right. That was an interesting experience because you got to see how things worked pretty well. Um, Interaction that was with when colleagues. Dr. Beering was still a president and uh, the The person, I think, who did a lot to um, establish a better working relationship between the Senate and the uh, Purdue administration was um, a gal who was, still is, an associate, I think she's an associate professor in management and economics. Charlene Sullivan? Yes. I think she had a lot to do with she was the smoothing the she was the president of the Senate for a while, and she was, I think she was very good about smoothing things. Yeah. She's very personable, too. Yeah, and I think that was a good thing. Yeah, that's right. Um, how, let's talk about uh, some awards, like the John H. Moriarty Award. Well, that was did a you, real... How did you find out about that? Did, not until you got there? Was I didn't know until I got there. Now, uh, Jane Taylor, who uh, is Jim's administrative assistant, called me and said, are you, are you going to be at the, I said, oh yeah, I'm going to be there. And it didn't occur to me that she had a particular reason for calling me, you know. So I could have been, you know, you could have knocked me over with a feather. It was very nice. Very nice. Well, and it's it was nice for my, a surprise. it was for the bioinformatics work, basically. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, Diane Ryan had a lot to do with that, but then I really, it was Shepherding. my idea that we have somebody like that, and it was my, and I also did a lot to, uh, along with her, to uh, get, get a, the thing set up. Get it, pull, get it pulled together. Yeah, exactly. Right. Any other awards that you got over time that you'd like to share with us? Do you think? No, any? I can't. Uh, okay. Now let's talk other? about um, SLA and your involvement with the Special Library Association and MLA. You still were involved with that? No, one? I was until. Oh, nice. 88, I guess, and okay. then I dropped out of that. You need to sort of specialize, I think. Um, well, I think I became involved with SLA because we were very SLA-oriented at the time that I came. Uh, certainly, Martha Bailey was uh, very and, much... And Emily was... Emily, of that. course, was very much involved in the higher levels, became president of uh, right. MLA. Uh, so... Um, I was a member of the Biological Sciences uh, 
division and also food and agriculture there. And I really didn't do a whole lot. I was you were on, on the program committee for the annual program in Oh, right. Well, that was something special. Emily came and asked me, uh, she said, would you be the liaison for Indiana? I said, okay. <laughs> on the program. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, basically, what I was trying to do was to entice people to come to Indiana. Which, so I... Um, was it being held in Indiana? Oh, yeah. Oh, it was, it was at, Indianapolis. Mm -hmm, okay. at Indianapolis. Uh, and I think Indianapolis is a really a really good city. I mean, a you can walk to the zoo. You can go to the Isle York, You can, you know, there's just a lot to do here. So I was trying to tell people there was a lot to do. And as you came in through the state, there was a lot to do. So I wrote these articles. I did read some of those, I know, right. The outlook. Trying to give people an, an idea of, okay, you come on? in this way, you'll come across blah, blah. You come this way. So, um, yeah, that was, that was pretty interesting uh, to do that. It, I felt we should have had a better turnout for the conference than we did. So I felt that was very disappointing. And, I don't think it would hurt the people from the East Coast and the West Coast to come to uh, <laughs> the Midwest, you know. You can tell I have a bias. Um, and you also yeah. served on the Biological Science Division Nominating Committee. Yeah, I did, I did do that. Right. Uh, so, and there was one other thing. I participated in some sort of, um, some sort of uh, program there about... Oh, well, I can't remember what it was. Then um, you were also involved with the USAIN, weren't you? Yes, Martha became involved you first, know, and that's the United States uh, Agricultural Information Network, which was primarily for librarians, but basically anybody who dealt in, in providing information for people in agriculture. So we did have a few extension people involved. Uh, yeah, I like that organization and the people in it. Right, no. and uh, for the researchers, the meeting next spring is going to be here. Right. Okay. Is that going to be the national? Uh, yeah, it is. They meet every two years. Okay. It's going to be here at Purdue. Right. How about hobbies and special interests? Any anything? Well, I like to read, especially uh, mysteries, so I've been doing quite a bit of reading. Also, Harry Potter. I <laughs> became a Harry Potter fan. Okay. Um, I wanted to see what all the fuss was about. The younger generation reading Harry Potter, so I dug in. Stu started on the first book, and I thought, "Oh, this is pretty interesting." And so, <laughs> just as bad as the kids were. Um, and I also like to work in the yard. Although, if you were to look at my yard right now, you'd wonder about that because I've got a bunch of weeds coming up. But I enjoyed that. Um, I took a class at the um, just two sessions of three to four hours, I guess, at the. Uh, Indianapolis Museum of Art on landscape design and actually made a little design for my yard which I'm still trying to execute and refine. Yeah. Um, I haven't done it yet but I'd like to work, uh, I'd like to be a master gardener. To do that you have to attend a class. And, yeah. Well that brings up the next thing about re your retirement activities. Share with us. What well that's what, I, that's what that I'm doing. Hobby. That's my that's what I'm doing. Right. That, that's uh, basically what I'm doing. And then uh, before I uh, left Purdue, I uh, had, was on the board, or still am on the board of the Lafayette Chamber Singers, and this is my second year being president of that board. Okay. And I'm also involved. Uh, I like to sing, so I've been a member of the Chancel Choir for at least 25 years. Um, I'm the librarian for the Chancel Choir, so I file the music away and create a little file, a little database of the, the musical pieces. Um, I also am on the, the associated with my church, which is, which is the First United Methodist Church. Um, there is a foundation, which is a separate legal entity, but uh, which is was established to support the church. So um, I'm, I was president of that board last year, and now I'm treasurer, which is about as challenging as being president. So anyway, so 
You keep me pretty active. And you still go to the uh, women's basketball? I still go to women's basketball. I really enjoy that. I know. And occasionally a football game. Occasionally a football game. I right. like to try to get to one football, at least one football game. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and I enjoy a lot of the cultural activities. And I'm active. I've been active for years uh, with the Indiana Fiddlers Gathering. From its early days. Yes. Well, it they were about ready to go out of existence because the people who had been working on it um, just were tired. And uh, it was a fundraiser for the, Chip uh, the Battleground Historical Association. And when that association merged with Tippecanoe County Historical Association, I think they just decided to, they would hang it up. And uh, Dave Samuelson, who had been the MC there for, for the event for years, um, sort of put a call out in the newspaper for people to come forward who would, wanted to keep it going. Sure. And so Nancy Hewish and Gretchen Stevens and I were three of the people from the Purdue Libraries who said, yes, we want well, this to continue, and we worked. And that was, that's been a lot of fun, and I've met people there I wouldn't have met ordinarily. Right. So I it's, really, it's grown over the years. Well, uh, it's still probably going to be a, a smaller festival. You may have as many as 5,000 people at one time, but no more than that. Uh, it's just a wonderful event. Family, Well, if you keep friendly. it small, then people can really interact. A lot of people come and right. observe they, or take a few lessons or whatever. They do, know. and a lot of people, some people don't even listen to the music on the stage. They go and they jam in groups, and that's what's fun for people. And you can walk around and listen to it. Yeah, and it's, it's just really, really nice. And... Uh, so that's that's been fun, and there are just a lot of things to do in this community. That's right. How about uh, favorite Purdue tradition and outstanding event? If you have either of those, a favorite Purdue tradition. Well, I guess I think of the I think of the football games where they all after the football game they go around the fountain and they have the band plays there. Uh, I, I, I like that. One thing that isn't a tradition, but that I think is, is very nice here, is the way in which the grounds are um, kept up. And um, I think whoever does the landscaping deserves a lot of credit because it's very attractive and well maintained. And, and it's very important in a campus this size that you have spots every now, every now and again where you can sit down and you can catch your breath and, and nice surroundings. And, and they've added good. more uh, um, fences and not fences but uh, well, chairs and, and uh, benches and whatever that mm -hmm. you can do that. There didn't used to be over the early years. There weren't as many of those. But they, I think they've done a very good job. So uh, Even along, there's a utilities building on University Street that's near the Life Sciences, uh, the uh, Lily. Mm -hmm. And it's just sort of like a Quonset hut kind of thing. And they planted flowers along it. And I think that says yeah, a really, lot about the right. place. You know, and it's really also nice. in some places, in some buildings, you see they put picnic, a picnic table out right. there. So people, it doesn't have to be, in most cases, it's just one. But yeah. It gives a nice thing to people. The weather's nice, you can go out there. And yeah. Sit. How about your uh, outstanding event? You know, one of those? Do you I mean, for me personally any, or for any, anything? Anything that comes to your mind, an event that you think, as you look back. Oh, well, it's a whole series of events, but I think definitely the technology has made a tremendous difference. Um, however, I do think you need to have your librarians associated with people who need the information. And so I always think you need to keep in mind for whom you are being a librarian. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in our committees and so on, we almost lose sight of that. So, okay. Any closing comments, Sarah? What do you think? Did you look back or look ahead? Well, I think I've almost made my closing comments here. Thank you very much, Sarah. Right. This concludes it. Thank, Thank you, you very much.